So hopefully you can see my slide, Modern Cosmology. So, awesome. Please do stop me if you have questions, but otherwise I will, because uh, I'm, I'm always happy to have interactive questions. It's lovely to be with you tonight. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of what I'll talk about tonight. I'll discuss a little bit about what we know about the universe, some of the mysteries that we still don't understand, and then some of the, uh, very briefly, some of the tools that are relevant to both South Africa and to Ghana. So you might start with what is cosmology? And I like this definition that came from um, Georges Lemaitre, who was uh, one of the first cosmologists. Um, he was a Jesuit priest. He said the evolution of the world, which what we mean now, the universe, the cosmos, can be compared to a display of fireworks that has just ended. Some few red wisps, ashes and smoke Standing on a cooled cinder, we see the slow fading of the suns, and we try to recall the vanishing brilliance of the origin of the worlds. It's a very poetic definition of cosmology. But basically, cosmology is the study of the whole universe, everything that we can be in contact with. So it's a very, um, very uh, big scale kind of thing. So uh, it's simultaneously the study of the smaller scales of the universe and the largest. Of course, it must be the largest because it's everything we know, but why is it also the smallest? Well, it turns out that um, the universe began in an incredibly dense state, a very, very tiny size. So to be able to understand the origin of the universe, we actually have to understand the laws of physics at the smallest scales. So I just want to comment a little bit about the scientific method. How do we do science? And the analogy I like to do is, uh, is through this picture of an apple. In the scientific method, we break things up into smaller and smaller pieces. This is the reductionism. And we study tiny little pieces of reality or chemistry, physics, but even you know electrical engineering, super refined. But then what we do is we try to build a picture of the universe. And uh, in, uh, so it's not an apple, it's a picture of an apple, but you know, we can learn a lot through this process of reductionism. Anyway, so um, cosmology is interested at tiny, tiny scales, because as I said, the origin of the universe, uh, the, the densities and the, the distances between particles were the size and smaller even. So we need to understand particle physics, but then we're also interested in the other side, scale of the, the other side of the universe. We're interested in you know, the universe at the larger scale. So for those of you who don't know astronomy, I, I, I heard many people from the planetarium, so this will not be new, but just to give a little bit of a scale, let's start at earth and, and scale upwards. We have the planets. Um, here's earth down in the bottom left corner. And of course, Jupiter is much bigger. Uh, we keep going, we come across the sun. Uh, beyond the sun, we have stars that are larger than our sun, Arcturus, for example. And we can keep going. And, and on this scale, the sun is just one pixel all the way up to Antares. So those are, those are stars. We keep going. We have gas clouds that can lead to the formation of new stars. Um, Similarly, these are gas clouds uh, seen by the Hubble Space Telescope, very famous pillar of, gods as, uh, of God, as, it, uh, as it's known. And then we can keep going to larger and larger scale. And then we reach the smallest scale that cosmologists are typically interested in, and that's a galaxy. And that is like the cell of the, the cosmos. And each galaxy has about 100 billion stars and light takes thousands of years to cross a galaxy. So these are pretty big. But, uh, and we, we see many types of galaxies. We see these uh, ellipticals with so many stars that they just appear to be a diffuse, diffuse uh, halo of light. We see beautiful spirals like, uh, uh, like this, the Whirlpool galaxy, like our own Milky Way galaxy. And then we see exotic galaxies that uh, may arise because of collisions between galaxies. Um, and uh, if we scale even further out, 
what we uh, what we see are clusters of galaxies, galaxies themselves grouped together under the uh, influence of gravity to form giant clusters. And one thing you can notice about this is this beautiful yellow gold color. Um, and that's char quite characteristic of galaxy clusters. They often turn quite golden and red. Whereas in the background, you can see blue galaxies and, and galaxies of other colors. And the thing about uh, galaxy clusters is they might be so big that light might take a million years to cross them. And so you can ask, well, what happens if we zoom even further out? Well, this is a, the Hubble deep field where they, they try to just stare, point the Hubble telescope just into the, a dark, very what appeared to be very empty part of the sky. And each point here is a galaxy. Each one of these probably has about 100 billion stars. And we now know, for, at least in our own galaxy, that almost every star has at least one planet. So chances are that each one of these galaxies has 100 billion planets or more. Over, in it. Right. And, and it's going to be okay. Now know, for, at least in our own galaxy, that almost every star has at least one planet. So Sorry. Chances are that each one of these galaxies has a hundred billion planets or more. Over, right. And, and it's going to be okay. Ah, thank you. I don't know what that was, but it was uh, slightly strange. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so you might ask, how big is the, the universe that we can see? And we can now see objects that are so distant that light has taken billions of years to reach us. So the universe is a big place, as they say. And we can make maps of the universe. So this is a nice picture of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Each one of these dots is one of these galaxies. And here, um, this is not the actual shape of the universe. Um, this is slices through the universe that we've been able to map uh, and place the galaxies so that we see this very distinctive kind of almost like bubble pattern. Um, here's a, another slice of it. And you can see that there are there regions where there are many galaxies, these very white regions, and then relatively dark regions where, which are voids where there are not many galaxies. And so you might ask, well, why does the universe look like that? Why does it have this kind of distribution of galaxies. Remember, each one of these little dots, in fact, is a galaxy with 100 billion stars. Well, the answer is gravity. Gravity is the key thing. If we were to start in the early universe, which is on the left, the far left, and look at a galaxy, we would, we would see a very sm a relatively smooth distribution of, of matter. And then over time, as we move to the right, Gravity pulls things together. It's that old joke, gravity sucks. And so it pulls galaxies together and it empties out the voids. And so what we're left with is a kind of bubble pattern um, of very characteristic of gravity. So we can simulate this in computers, in a supercomputer. And that's what I would like to show you now is some, some beautiful um, simulations. Um, Sorry, what time did I start speaking? Just so that I know what time I, or what time should I finish? So you have about 15 minutes more. Okay, perfect. So let me just quickly find um, the... Okay. Okay, so let me share the screen. So this is a, a simulation uh, called the illustrious simulation. So this is a, a supercomputer simulating uh, what we believe was happening in the early universe. And uh, so you should see a simulation and it's zooming in here. This is as we, uh, so, they run the supercomputer for a long time until today. They track the density of matter, the temperature of the gas, the amount of dark matter, all these things. And now we're zooming in. Um, 
on the simulation. We can see on the left, it says 1.3 MPC, that's million, you know, millions of parsecs. And so we were able to, in these simulations, create uh, fake galaxies that look very similar to our own Milky Way galaxy or the galaxy we see. And now we can zoom out. And now we will look at, at the gas density. So these simulations are amazing because they can track, you know, tens of billions of particles to build some observe in the universe and which do a pretty good job. So that's how fast things are moving. These are these bubbles are supernova remnants of exploding stars. Um, this is the dark matter density, and we can see this filament, filamentary, almost like web uh, structure. So that was the illustrious. Um, okay. So I now. Um, And if you enjoyed that simulation, I just recommend you to uh, to have a look online. There are many beautiful N-body simulations. Sorry, Manuel, can you see the, the simulation or can you see yourself? Um, I can see your slide. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so that's that's a very whirlwind tour of cosmology, of what we do know about the universe. Let me just tell you about some of the things that we don't yet understand. Some of the things that we don't understand is that most of the matter in the universe is invisible to us. It's dark. Um, how do we know that there's stuff out there that's dark? Well, let's look at this image of uh, that I showed you before of clusters. You can see these streaks i hope you can have, see the very have boost yeah the slide is not in presentation mode okay yeah. let me thank you okay so hopefully what yes. you can see is the golden golden picture again and let me just uh, show you what i was saying before you can see these streaks these long almost vertical streaks or, and well, they actually go around like this. And what that is, is gravitational, it's called gravitational lensing. The, the gravity of the matter in the cluster is so strong that it's bending light from galaxies behind the cluster. And that, that galaxy image is being stretched into a, a long thin filament, a bit like what you get if you hold a wine glass or, or an ordinary glass up to the light, you'll see similar effects. But we can predict how strong that gravitational lensing should be. And it's there's a way too much gravitational lensing. The bending is far too strong, given the amount of matter that we can actually see. So there must be a lot of missing matter. And we call this dark matter. And in fact, there's many different ways we can see that there's dark matter. This is just one. And so, you know, it's a bit like you receive a keyboard uh, in the post but most of the keys are keys which have labels on them. And that's a bit where we are with the universe. 95% of the universe is unknown. We don't know what it is. 5% of the universe, it's mostly hydrogen and helium, mostly hydrogen. But this is a huge mystery. What, what on earth are these, uh, is this missing matter and why is it there? The mystery is that the universe is expanding in a very strange way. We know that the universe is expanding. Um, and I don't mean it in this sense. Uh, it reminds me of this joke of uh, a mathematics question. N, and uh, Peter just expanded out, made it bigger. No, 
what I mean by the expansion of the universe is that the, the universe itself is getting bigger as far as we know. And the way we know this is actually now, a hundred years ago, um, we, we, re we saw, and Hubble and others, Lemaitre and uh, others, noticed, Slifer, that the further away a galaxy was from us, the faster it was moving away from us. And none of the galaxies, more or less, were moving towards us. So that's very hard to explain, right? Imagine that you, people are all around you, you open your eyes, and then you suddenly feel, see that everyone is walking away from you. You're in the middle of a field. Not just that everyone's walking away from you, but the people who are further away from you are actually moving away faster than the people who are close to you. It's very hard to explain. The standard explanation, and the one that we are, that's only made sense so far, is that we are in an expanding universe. And so imagine, uh, as an example, imagine that you have a balloon and galaxies are painted onto that balloon. As the balloon gets bigger, uh, the galaxies will all move away from each other. So the fact that galaxies are moving away from us doesn't mean that we are in a special place. Every galaxy would see exactly the same thing, that all other galaxies were moving away from them. And that's the main reason that we believe the universe is expanding, that we observe that the further galaxies are away from us, the faster they're moving away. And we measure this through what's called redshift, the fact that light gets stretched. The further away a galaxy is, the more the light is stretched. So, you know, we've known that the universe is expanding for nearly 100 years, but about 25, well, nearly 30 years ago now, we discovered that the universe is not only expanding, in other words, getting bigger, but it's actually speeding up. It's as if someone has got their foot on the accelerator pedal of the universe. So the universe is getting bigger and bigger, faster and faster. Is that a surprise? Absolutely, it's a surprise. Because we expect that because gravity pulls things together, even if the universe was expanding, we would be expecting gravity to be pulling back like a spring. And so we expected the, this expansion to be slowing down. And maybe we thought it would stop and collapse again, but we certainly expected it to be slowing down. But instead, what we found, um, yeah, 20, 22 or 23 years ago was that the universe is actually speeding up. And I can go into lots of details to why that is, but basically uh, the reason is that, uh, well, there's many ways we can test this and, and they all more or less agree, but basically we are now pretty sure that the universe is accelerating. And that's very strange because as I said, gravity is attractive. Gravity pulls things together. It doesn't push things apart. So effectively we need to have some sort of anti-gravity in the universe. Um, as well as the ordinary gravity that you and I know of, you know, we are stuck to our chairs because of gravity, but on somehow on very large scales, there's some form of anti-gravity, which we don't understand. What's even more strange is that when we look at the history of the universe, for most of the history of the universe, the universe was decelerating, slowing down. And then only about 5 billion years ago, it suddenly started to speed up again. Not again, well, speed up. And, and the question is, well, what triggered that change? Why did it suddenly start to speed up 5 billion years ago? Um, and ironically, that's around the time that the Earth was formed. So there seems to be this annoying coincidence, and scientists hate coincidences. So, you know, that's one of the things we, we really would love to understand is why... Why did the universe start to accelerate about 5 billion years ago? Why not 10 billion years into the future or 50 billion years into the future? So this is the problem of dark energy. It's also known as the coincidence problem. So um, there are many other mysteries like why is the universe made of matter? Why don't we see any antimatter in the universe or large amounts of antimatter? Um, and why is there matter? Because 
naively, we would create the same amounts of matter and antimatter in the early universe. Why was there an asymmetry that led to matter? Um, so there are many interesting uh, unsolved problems in cosmology. Um, so as I say, we call this thing that, that it's causing the universe to accelerate, we call it dark energy, but it's just a name because we don't really understand its properties. Um, although I can tell you some funny stories about it. Einstein actually introduced a thing he called the cosmological constant. And then when we found that the universe was expanding, he said, oh, I should never have done that. There was a mistake. It supposedly called it his greatest mistake. But ironically, the Einstein cosmological constant would exactly give you this accelerated expansion. So ironically, Einstein was, uh, was right or, or very close to right. Anyway, it turns out that this dark energy has to dominate most of the energy in the universe, which is very strange. You know, why do we live in a universe like this? Very, very strange. Anyway, so, you know, be, whenever scientists come up against these kind of scale of mysteries, they, they, they want to go and try and solve it. And so for that, you need new tools. And I'll just very, very briefly mention uh, one of them, which is the square kilometer array. Um, the square kilometer array will, be, will start construction in, in the next few years. And it will cost uh, you know, somewhere around a couple of billion dollars. Um, and the end goal, although we will begin construction of phase one uh, in a few years, the end goal will have several thousand dishes in, at least in Africa. And about two thirds of the SKA will be in Africa. The rest will be in Australia. Um, and so we'll have a lot of these kind of dishes. And although the majority of the dishes will be African partner countries, of which um, Ghana is one, and I saw this recent news uh, about um, the conversion of um, a satellite Earth station to be used as part of what's called the VLBI network, which we may hear about just now. So this is just a way of saying that right now is an extremely exciting time for astronomy, um, especially astronomy in Africa. And I will close by saying that we've discovered an amazing amount of things about the universe. We really understand an incredible amount about the universe. We can build computer models, these massive sim uh, simulations that produce a lot of what we see in the universe to very high accuracy. We really understand a lot. But at the same time, there are these profound mysteries that we do not understand yet. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. Actually, it kind of reminds me of COVID, except maybe even more mysterious. So uh, it's a very, um, a very interesting subject. And I think, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. That was right on time. <laughs> After 25 years, you get used to it. <laughs> oh, thank you thank so you. much, Bruce. That's like uh, so many years of knowledge and experience put in 25 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we can take two questions, two questions, and then we can move on. I have a question, but I'll allow the audience uh, two questions. Hi everyone. Do we have any questions for Bruce? I think yes. Hi. My hand is up as well, um, Eva. <laughs> All right. So we have Evelyn. Hi, Evelyn. Oh, okay. Someone was talking. So, right. My question is: uh, We're talking about the expanding universe, which we kind of know and we know about redshift. How is it that we don't quite know what we are expanding into? So we are expanding, but where are we going? And is there going to be any bounce back? You know, we're talking about the anti-gravity, et cetera. But yes. I would really want to really have some understanding of if we're expanding, where are we expanding to? Which space are we actually going into? So that's we not very, have the answer? Yes, that's a very common question. And the simple answer is we don't know because the universe, which, you know, 
we know we can see four dimensions, three dimensions of space and one of time. That is all we have access to. If, if we're expanding like a balloon into space, we would need to be able to exit our universe and, and go into that bigger space, mm. which of course we don't know how to do that. So the standard answer is we don't know, we can't know, and it doesn't matter because the nice thing about the mathematics of the geometry and especially the universe uh, is, is described by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Einstein's theory of relativity says, don't worry about the space that you're expanding into. It has no, it's not important. You know, it has no effect. So although I understand your question, well, what are we expanding into? From the point of view of science, which is, is limited to things that we can test and detect and interact with, that question is forever beyond the realm of, uh, of knowledge. However, I will just say that there are many theories. You can construct them if you want. You could say, my theory is that we live actually in seven dimensions and that our four dimensional universe is expanding in the seven dimensions. You could do that if you wanted. There are theories like string theory, which require us to live, for example, in 11 dimensions. But even in that context, you would have a four dimensional subspace of the 11 that's expanding. And you could still ask, well, what's happened? Where is that expanding into? Um, and so unfortunately we can't we just can't answer those questions. All right, thank you. Pleasure. And, and, All right. and then your question was the second one, will we bounce back? We, we might, uh, we could potentially, even though we're accelerating at the moment, we can't be sure that, uh, that the acceleration will, won't end, the expansion will stop and we may recollapse. There are models based on an infinite sequence of uh, expansions and contractions. So. All right. Thank you so much, Bruce. Pleasure, Evan. We have Leo. Leo, can you uh, share your question? Yes. Yeah, this is Leo. I, I Hi, hope Leo. you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so Professor Bruce, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I missed quite a bit of your, your talk because I joined quite late. But I've got a couple of very quick questions. And the first one relates to astrobiology. And I don't know whether you have any knowledge or whether it's an area of your expertise. However, I've often wondered that is it, or rather, what is the likelihood that we are going to discover some early forms of on other planets? And I'm particularly mm -hmm. talking about exoplanets and a lot of the talk of rudimentary life thought that may exist on some of these um, outer bodies or certainly planets. The other piece is about black holes and again I don't know whether you can speak to that. My question is and, and again forgive my ignorance is it a literal hole if you know what I mean? Yeah. Awesome. So I'm not an astrobiologist, so I'll give you a very naive answer. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, or maybe slightly more, we didn't know of a single planet outside of our solar system. Now we know that basically every star in our galaxy probably has a planet. So for sure, the probability of life on extra, you know, of extra, you know, planets outside of our solar system is massively higher than it used to be. And I think many people would say it's very likely. I think many astronomers would be very surprised if there wasn't a lot of life of some form in the universe. Um, but I'll probably, I'll just leave it at that. In terms of black holes, I can give you the answer in terms of Einstein's theory of relativity, which again is the right theory to describe this. In Einstein's theory, you have a massive body Beyond a certain critical density, nothing can stop it from collapsing. And in his theory, in his equations, it collapses to a point of infinite density. And that is a point of infinite curvature. So in that sense, it stops being, it's not a hole in the usual sense,
but it is a point where the theory doesn't make sense. And there are many speculations about what that should mean, because as soon as the object gets smaller than an atom, you would need a quantum theory of gravity. But, but there are uh, ideas that, you know, it could be a bridge to another part of uh, space. Um, you know, there are many theories. So in a sense, there is a hole. There's a, a puncture, a puncture of space and time where things don't make sense. So it really is. Um, but it's also a hole in the sense that there's a sphere, sure. the event horizon, that if you go inside that, you will never get out. So in that sure. sense, it's yeah. like a deep hole that's so deep you could never climb out. So. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's the event horizon or certainly the stories about that that got me thinking whether it's a literal hole because, you know, when the team actually first announced, uh, you know, the, their findings, the way they described them, especially with the, I think it's called the accretion, um, you know, there's something about accretion and, and some of the particles that were being churned out of what looked like a literal hole. And, and that got me thinking that, is it a literal hole that I guess can therefore swallow planets, which apparently, or, or indeed stars, you know, like when you think about, um, you know, stars reaching the end of their lives, apparently, you know, black holes can actually suck them out. And I'm thinking it must be a hole, obviously. <laughs> we, we could have many discussions, Leo. I th I, I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but I'm happy afterwards perhaps to carry on chatting. Sure, sure, sure. Th th thank you, anyhow. Thank you. Thank you, Leo, for your question. Uh, I think we're running a bit out of time, but we'll take a question from Stuart, then we can uh, directly go into Sarah's presentation so that we can still uh, be in the time, a lot of time. Stuart. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Bruce. Um, I, I think about these things a lot. I'm not a scientist and um, uh, I read a lot, but uh, always confused by these things. But one thing I want to ask, how are we sure that the speed of light is constant throughout the universe? Uh, and then there's this strange anomaly when you think about relativity that uh, if we, I mean, the way I look at it, if, if a photon had a, con had a consciousness, a photon traveling from a million light years away, uh, time would not exist traveling at the speed of light. And therefore, f for itself, would it feel like it's actually got here instantly? Uh, these are sort of anomalies, they're weird. And then the, um, I think uh, uh, Leo was talking about black holes. This is my third point, really. I'm trying to get through these things quickly. But where I've, I've heard that if you enter a black hole, or at least you get to the event horizon of a black hole, if we were observing that, that spaceship on the event horizon, we would observe it as stationary because uh, it's, it's now reached a point uh, where time has stopped for it, it, the spaceship, people on the spaceship believe they're, they're still in normal time. What would those people in the spaceship see of the universe? Surely they would see the universe go through its life just like that and disappear. Oh, yes. Like, because yeah. time has, has slowed down to such an extent that time in, in its sense no longer exists. So those are the three kind of things that I'm trying to put them together. Is there any sense in any of these things? Oh, absolutely. Well, let me start with your first one about the, how do we know the speed of light is constant throughout the universe? The short answer is we don't. Um, we can test for things. Um, so, uh, and, and unfortunately, you're, this is quite a, well, uh, it's, it's great, but it's also unfortunate. This is quite a profound and difficult question with many layers to it. So uh, a glib answer is not going to address it. The first is we measure distance as being a meet is the distance light travels in a certain amount of time. So by that definition, the speed of light is always constant because we use light as our ruler for measuring distance. So if the, if the speed of light doubled, nobody would notice because our rulers would get twice as big, right? So that's the point. Uh, that's one point. But in fact, I've worked on theories in which the speed of light can change. Um, and there are interesting theories um, in Einstein's most, in the basic formulation of Einstein's theory of relativity, the speed of light is constant. Um, we can go and test for that. We can go and try and test for the speed of light changing with time, changing in different directions. And we've never, 
we've never seen any deviation. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means we've never seen it. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's that, that's the situation. And so far, we have it's a bit like UFOs. No, we haven't seen uh, we haven't seen the speed of light varying. Um, your second point with, was about was about black holes and what would you see if you were on a black hole falling through the event horizon? Yeah, so as you fall into the black hole, you go down this gravitational well. And so light climbing out has to work quite hard to get out of the, gra out of the gravitational pull of the black hole. And it does that by giving up some of its energy. It's almost like paying to get out. And the energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency. So what you see is that the light would get redder and redder and redder as this object went into the black hole. And so depending on the details, you might not see it because it, it went into the infrared or into the radio. But also time slows down for, so if the, if the, um, if the spaceship was emitting a pulse every second, what we would receive is that the time between the pulses would get longer and longer and longer. And then eventually it would basically freeze on the event horizon. We wouldn't actually see it go into the event horizon, through the event horizon. But if you were on board, um, at least in Einstein's theory, you would just pass through the event horizon and you wouldn't, you sort of wouldn't notice it. Um, at least if the black hole was big enough, if the, if the black hole was big enough. Where it gets complicated is if you say, well, okay, but that's a classical theory of Einstein. We need to consider quantum effects because this is a, this is a weird, strong gravity. Then nobody knows what happens at the event horizon. And there are some interesting indications that weird things might happen at the event horizon. So, um, so I think the, the answer is we don't, we don't know. We don't know. So maybe I'll just stop there. As I said, I'm happy to carry on chatting after, after the whole uh, seminar is finished, but I don't want to steal time from our next speaker. Thank you, Bruce. I, uh, I think we just jump right into and invite Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Okay, let me just... Uh, Hello. Okay. Uh, just a minute, let me... Sorry, I can't see myself, so I don't know what you're Are seeing. Are you back from Mars already? Is... Yes, yes, I wasn't there long. <laughs> um, is that flickering fan very annoying that's all right Are you sure? no it might think it's all right. I, I think it might it's all right here yeah. sorry just one second oh is that better no not really okay right so let me share my screen hello i feel very much like i've drawn the short straw because that talk was fantastic. And I'm sure everybody is just desperate to ask hundreds of questions. <laughs> and thinking, oh no, now Sarah's coming to talk, no. <laughs> so I will try and be quite brief so that there is time. I'm sure, I mean, I've got questions as well. I mean, that was that was the really great um, overview. So, so I suppose what I'm talking about is hopefully if you've been, hang on, Right. If you've been inspired by uh, what Bruce was talking about and you think, oh, I'd really like to learn more. Is there more that I can find out here in Ghana? What can I do? Where can I study? Or, you know, that who else can I talk to to learn more? I, I think maybe that's that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so and this is really just a brief overview from me. Uh, there's quite a few people uh, in the audience that I know and who know me. So please, if I miss something out, uh, or if I say something and you think, oh, actually that's changed now, do feel free to say so. So this is just kind of my overview. Um, I gave a bit of a, uh, 
uh, brief overview before. Um, one thing about astronomy is there's loads of acronyms. So yes, we've already spoken about AFAS and uh, uh, the planetarium and um, uh, National Astronomy Education Coordinator for the Office of Astronomy Education. Oh, too many, too many acronyms. But basically, I'm just into uh, informal science and astronomy education. And most people know me from being uh, um, uh, involved with the planetarium for, for many years now. And in case you're wondering, because uh, obviously I don't sound Ghanaian, I am a dual national British Ghanaian. I wasn't born here, so that's why I sound the way I do. Um, before we uh, go on, I just wanted to show this picture. This is one of uh, a picture that I really like showing. I sometimes think that people think, oh, astronomy, it's that slightly weird niche subject, you know, those odd people in a... This image from the International Astronomical Union is showing how astronomy encompasses so many other subjects, you know, from optics and uh, uh, computing and electronics to physics, chemistry, biology, and then the, if you like, the social sciences as well, anthropology and philosophy and, uh, you know, global citizenship and things like that. So, and this is also great if you're... Um, you know, you could encourage kids, whatever, whatever they're interested in, it will often be related to astronomy in some way. If you're studying IT, you can do astronomy. If you're studying biology, you can do astrobiology and, and so on. So it really is quite unique and it's this very all-encompassing subject. And, and incidentally, these colours in the middle are, you might recognize they're from the SDGs. So there is a big push from the IAU uh, of encouraging people to think of how we can use astronomy to make the world a better place uh, and to develop the world and to try and help solve the, the SDGs. So, so it's not a, this kind of something that's apart from everybody and apart from society, it's very much part of society. So sometimes, you know, they do that thing and say, oh, do you want the good news or the bad news? So I'll start with the, with the bad news in, in kind of quotes. So you might say, OK, astronomy, you might think, oh, astronomy in Ghana, hang on a minute, but we don't have undergraduate astronomy courses. There's not much astronomy in the curriculum. There's no science centre. The museum in Accra, sadly, is, is, is not great. And we don't even hear much about astronomy in, in the news. However, the good news is we have these uh, three uh, institutions that are working hard to change all that. And there's others as well, but uh, these, these are the main ones I'm talking about. So we've got the planetarium, of course. Uh, we have the Ghana Radio Astronomy Observatory and we have the All Nations University. Sorry, I forgot the uh, arrow up there. Um, briefly, let me go there first. Um, I'm sure if people are from Ghana, I'm sure they will know about the, the big news of Ghana Sat one a few years ago, made headline news and very exciting that, that we have people working on satellite technologies. And I think this is a, a, a huge thing for the future. Um, there was a space generation workshop earlier this year and some of the talks about, you know, the satellite technologies and the, uh, you know, the remote sensing and what the kind of data that you can get was was amazing. So definitely uh, one for the future, you know, looking at illegal mining, coastal erosion, crop coverage and, and all sorts of things. Um, uh, but then we also have the Ghana Radio Astronomy Observatory. So if you're certainly if you're in Ghana, everybody should know that we have a radio observatory. So if you didn't know, now you know. This is huge. So here it was being opened by our president in 2017. It's a fantastic place. It's at Kuntunsi on the uh, Kamasi Road, just past uh, Pukwasi. So it's not too too far away, not too difficult to get to. Um, oh, let me just show this little video. I love this little time lapse video. So it was a telecommunications antenna that's been converted, refurbished to be a radio telescope. So that's a telescope that can receive radio waves from from space and analyze them. Um, yeah, ignore, inaugurated 2017. So the diameter there is 32 meters. It's so impressive when you go there. It's just like wow. It's really really exciting. Um, it can be used as a single instrument on on its own but it can also be used as part of a, a network, a, a, a network of radio telescopes. Um, it's used for the DARA basic radio astronomy training, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. 
uh, schools can visit. And uh, it, it's also, if you like, related to the, the PragSAC projects. All of those I'll briefly talk about. Um, so as I said, you can use a radio telescope on its own, um, but you can, if you like, make more powerful observations if you combine a whole load of telescopes together. So down here, apologies, I don't have the credits. Um, this is uh, the Meerkat array in South Africa. Um, and basically by combining all these single telescopes together, it's like the equivalent of one huge telescope and you get incredible, incredible results. So the idea is that eventually there will be uh, an all African um, array. So this map up here, I'm not sure how uh, clear it is, but these white dots, this is from a, a, a paper that showed, uh, again, these old uh, radio, radio communications antennas, which could be refurbished uh, into telescopes. And now not, not all of them are, are actually part of this project, but this is all part of the um, African VLBI network project. So VLBI is very long baseline interferometry. So interferometry is the technique that's used to combine the information from all the individual dishes. So this is a, a fantastic idea. I mean, the idea of having an African array. So just think of the opportunities there for, um, you know, human capacity development, uh, for, the, for the engineering, and of course the science uh, and the collaboration between all the countries. That would be, that would be great. And our uh, Contunsi Observatory is the first of those, the first of that network to be up and running. Um, but the, the telescope can also contribute to other arrays. There are already other radio telescope arrays around the world. And down here in the, in the bottom right is what's called the EVN, the European network. And if you can see all these dots are where the telescopes are. And you can see they're all, they're mainly in Europe and then a bit, and some to the east. But notice they're all kind of north of the equator with just this one in South Africa down here. So there's a big gap. And obviously, if you have more telescopes here, you're going to improve that network. So uh, for the Contunsi telescope to be able to be part of this array, it's going to make a very valuable contribution. Uh, so it really is a, a real asset to have that, uh, that telescope there. And um, you know, the fact of, that we are so close to the equator is also a very favorable condition for astronomy. Um, you know, if you're in the far north, you can only see the the stars and, and the, the, the sources in, in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're in the far South, you'll only see the ones in the South, but if you're near the equator, you can see both. So you, it's a, a, a really great position. Um, so um, I'm, I mentioned uh, the DARA project. Um, this stands for Development in Africa with Radio Astronomy, and it's basically a human capacity develop, development project um, funded through the UK and South Africa. And basically it provides a basic radio astronomy training program for about um, 10 or 12 people in each country uh, each year or so. Um, so we're now up to the, the, the fifth version, the fifth cohort. And the whole idea is after this training program, we hope that most of the participants will go on to further training, masters and PhD, so that then uh, they can come back and they'll be qualified to use those uh, radio telescopes, which hopefully will be coming up uh, in all the different countries in Africa in that map that I showed you before. Um, so over here on the right, I'm sure some of you all know uh, Bernard Sabri, uh, our first astronomer from quite a few years ago. But now uh, we have many, many up and coming masters and PhDs. Please, I know some of you are here, please. I know I haven't got everybody. If I've missed anybody out, it's not deliberate. <laughs> so please, no one to take offense. I'm just showing that now we have a nice crop of, you know, young, exciting Ghanaians uh, getting, uh, the, getting uh, trained in astronomy. So this is a really, uh, a really good thing. And uh, what's really exciting is right now at the observatory, there is DARA training going on. Now, uh, when the DARA program started, all the facilitators were, almost all the facilitators were um, international. Uh, but now the DARA alumni can actually take over the training. So there can be online training from some of the international facilitators, but 
you know, right now the, the students are at the observatory doing, making observations uh, and analyzing the data, doing data reduction and so on. And it's our Dara alumni who are facilitating that. So we've really progressed and that's fantastic. The other thing I is that um, Dara students come come from different countries. They come from those um, SKA partner countries that uh, Bruce mentioned, and actually some other countries as well. So there are students from Kenya, Tanzania, right now they're, I think, from Zambia and uh, Madagascar are coming. And that's also important because then we're building um, a network of African astronomers, and that's also extremely valuable. Those are your, your colleagues, your peers. Those are people you can ask, oh, uh, you know, how did you solve this problem? How can we get funding for this? How can we get together to work on this project? So uh, I, that for me is also very exciting. Um, schools, school parties can visit the observatory, inspiring the next generation, you know, learning about uh, the observatory and what it does and uh, learning other things about astronomy. And as I mentioned, there's this PragSAC project. Uh, which, so here we are, we're all, we're all former uh, Dara, cohort students. Uh, we, we started a project setting up astronomy clubs in schools, again trying to get kids interested in science. So we go and do uh, these astronomy club sessions trying to make them very practical uh, and, and engaging. Uh, but it's important to remember that the teachers also are, are important. They're the ones there, you know, impacting the students every day and of course they're often under-resourced and under-trained. So to help them is is all uh, extremely important. Uh, and also we've created some D for that. So there's, so that's, uh, if you like, the observatory. Then, of course, the, the planetarium. Uh, I'm very happy that Jacob and Jane are, are here today, the founders and directors of the, the planetarium. First one, uh, uh, well, for a long time, the first one across all of, you know, Western, Central and uh, Eastern Africa. And I think the first digital planetarium in the whole of Africa, so quite an incredible uh, place. Uh, we deal mainly with um, if you're at public engagement, public outreach and, and schools and, and, and teachers. That's kind of the level that we deal with, trying to inspire Ghanaians with our, with our universe. Um, so we do all sorts of things, obviously not so much now with COVID, but you know, school visits, science demos, teachers workshops, robotics clubs, uh, electronics clubs, uh, we have guest speakers and so on. Um, we even had birthday parties and even a wedding. There was even a wedding in the planetarium. And we've had, yes, about 40,000 visitors in the last uh, 10 years or so. So yeah, we have school visits, lots of questions and answer, lots of discussions, we get a planetarium show. Um, they, sometimes they get science demonstrations. I'm sure most of the people here will know that uh, there's quite a, a lot of issues around uh, get, trying to get kids interested in science and not enough uh, hands-on science in school. So they're always very excited to see the demonstrations that we do. Uh, public events at weekends for the, the general public is, and it's often families with, with kids. So we try and do lots of fun hands-on activities. And then of course, uh, telescope viewings to really get the, the wow factor. Uh, we're lucky to have quite a few telescopes that have been donated and uh, th those evenings are very popular and uh, it really does get people excited. This picture here was just taken with my phone, but it's, it's, it's always exciting when people look through a telescope for the first time to see the moon. And of course, you can do daytime astronomy as well. Uh, we, we went and showed the, the transit of Mercury. There is a tiny dot somewhere here <laughs> that's the planet Mercury passing in front of the sun. Uh, and also the various partial eclipses that we've had over the past few years. So all these are opportunities to engage the public and get people excited about astronomy and about science and just about the world around us. Uh, we also set up some uh, astronomy clubs. We had some funding from the IAU. So we had some an astronomy club project and we've been doing some online sessions recently again because of the, the COVID situation. Uh, so le leaping ahead a little bit, I just wanted to show um, in the wider aspect of astronomy in Africa. So we now have AFAS, the African 
an astronomical sustainability of astronomy in Africa and be a voice for astronomy in Africa and promote, uh, you know, professional astronomers and so on. The outreach committee created these uh, maps. It's actually, uh, they're actually interactive. Obviously, these are just screenshots. And maybe I can share the links with Gamali later. So there's one interactive map which shows all the amateur astronomy organisations. Now, obviously, these were just ones who registered with us up, up to sometime last year. But of course, we can keep adding as, as new clubs are added. So if you wanted to join an astronomy club, you can go and click on any of these icons and find out the contact details. Uh, and then over here, we have the observatories uh, in Africa. And again, some people may be surprised um, that there are observatories outside South Africa. I expect most people know that there's quite a few in South Africa, but there are these other observatories dotted around and there are more coming up. Um, so these are uh, some nice maps to show you the, the kind of resources that are going on in, uh, in Africa. So there are places that you can learn about astronomy. Uh, it's, not, it's not all bad news, it's good news. So the Ghana Planetarium is great for schools and groups, also for the general public. Uh, you can find out about starting a school astronomy club. Uh, we do have volunteers, although again now because we're not doing so many public events, uh, not really so much of that at the moment. Um, the, the observatory again great for encouraging school visits and finding out again if they can if we can start up astronomy clubs. Uh, you can use the map to join an astronomy club or start one of your own. Um, at Pasea, sorry, I don't think I mentioned that before. This is um, uh, an organization organization that does a week-long uh, astronomy school, um, usually every couple of years. Uh, the latest one has actually just been postponed till next year because of the situation, but it's a one-week school um, either for postgraduates where they do a more um, if you like, technical, uh, technical aspects or for undergraduates and teachers where you do uh, basic astronomy and um, Courses up like some inquiry learning, uh, and that that's a that's a that's a great opportunity if you apply and and, and manage to get on that. And then of course the the Dara uh, basic radio astronomy training as well. Uh, and so I've got AFAS on here, also space generation. So there are opportunities, there are organisations, there are people you can talk to, you know, and find out how can I learn more, how can I get involved. Uh, so the community is growing. Uh, I, I do think it's exciting and, and it's growing. So yes, that's all I have to say really. Thank you very much. I wanted to hurry so that because I'm sure as I said people have more questions <laughs> about cosmology. Thank you so much Sarah. I think we, we, we made you uh, run through your presentation. No, no, it's, so fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's <laughs> fine. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we already have a hand up. We have about a few minutes for questions and answers. I'm sure so many people have so many questions. I have so many questions personally. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Evans. Evans to take us through the question and answer section. I can see a few hands up already. So Evans will take it from there and then uh, any questions you have, we'll just I can take hear it right me. away. Uh, thank you, Bruce yes. and uh, Sarah for the wonderful presentation. So before I take the question and answer, I personally have a question uh, for Bruce. Uh, I think two questions for Bruce and uh, I one for Sarah. So uh, Prof, uh, please, I guess in it basic sense, so what is the ultimate uh, fate of the universe? Sorry, could you, uh, what is my, what of the universe? Like, um, I just want to know like, uh, uh, as this in its simplest form, so what is the ultimate fate of the universe? Ah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So good question. Uh, the simple answer is we don't know. And I, it will, if, if it were to continue accelerating, in other words, keep doing what it does now, it just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it will get colder and colder and colder and density will drop and drop and drop. And the universe would live forever. Um, but all the stars would die and the universe would end up being cold, uh, and empty basically. So a little bit sad. Um, the alternative, as I said before, is that it could expand, reach some maximum, and then recollapse. And as it recollapses, it would get more dense. And as it gets more dense, the temperature would go up, um, and then it would collapse down to 
another big bang and then we don't know what would happen maybe it would explode again uh, we don't know so those are so those are roughly the two um standard answers um and i would say the first is the more likely from just in terms of what's happening now um yeah okay so my second question and this will probably be a little bit technical but from your presentation i got to understand that as the universe expands the gravity causes the ripple to grow in strength like waves are approaching the, sh the shores. So, uh, and the slightly less dense region becomes uh, more dense and collapse like a, a giant sort of breakers to form galaxies and stars and planets. So I, I, I just want to ask what happens to the less dense area? What happens to them or what's inside them? Yeah, no, what uh, if let's say the denser area all becomes denser and eventually breaks up into stars and galaxies and what have you, what becomes of the less dense area or the region in the universe? So in those in those models, in those areas, the voids, they're just very empty. They they just uh, I mean they have some matter in them, they have some uh, you know. It's a bit like living in the desert. It's like the Sahara. If you live in the Sahara, you know, there, there's stuff there. There's just not many people. So those less dense regions are just a bit emptier um, and they don't have enough matter to form clusters of galaxies, to form galaxies. Although you do, f you do for find the odd galaxy kind of living in the middle of nowhere, you know, a bit like you find a village in the, in the, in, in the desert sometimes. So... Yeah, it's just less empty. It's okay. just more empty, sorry, not less empty, <laughs> more empty. Okay. Thank you, that'll be it for my end. So, uh, Jokanaya, if I got the name right, please, uh, could you ask your question? Okay, um, th th thank you, um, Evans. Um, and thank you to the presenters as well. Um, I, I have got um, two questions, uh, one for uh, Professor Bruce, I think I've already put it on the chat that um, when you look at um, the square kilometer array, you paid reference to, to that project. Um, to what extent are the benefits of that um, project going to be somehow equally distributed to the African continent, uh, given that you know we are exploring this common heritage, uh, we are exploring the universe. So uh, how do we ensure that, you know, every nation in, in Africa benefit out of the project? Then the other one is for Sarah. Um, um, I, I'm impressed by um, quite a number of uh, initiatives that um, uh, you are doing uh, within the planetarium and the whole of Ghana society in terms of astronomy. But... Um, I, I see a situation where there is, you are raising a lot of demand among the, you know, students and even uh, those in primary, secondary schools and all that. But now uh, the, the curriculum is too slow to, 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 to have uh, all these other, you know, uh, structures in place. So it's like, uh, I, I see it as more like uh, putting the cart before the horse. So uh, how are we going to reconcile on that one? Um, yeah, I think those are the two questions that I have for now. Thank you. Sarah, would you like to go first? Ah, okay then. Um, well, I'm not sure if I'd say it's putting the card before the doors. Um, I think for in, in terms of school, uh, the idea of, a, I mean, what people often say about astronomy is it's like a gateway science. So you can use astronomy to get kids interested in all the other sciences because they say, oh, yes, I want to learn about the planets. And then you can say, right, now we're going to learn about the scale of distances and you have to use maths and ratios and proportions. And before you know it, they've done a whole load of stuff that they didn't think they were interested in. So, so to, to me, it's, I mean, it's, it's astronomy and all the sciences and we need astronomy and all the sciences and the technical skills and so on to develop the country. So I'm not saying everyone has to be an astronomer. Uh, I'm saying 
I mean, I love astronomy, but yeah, if you want to do astronomy, that's great. But also I think astronomy can get many people of different levels more interested in science, which is which is going to be useful. And, and you know, so they can go on and do, you know, engineering or physics or chemistry and whatever. And um, it, I, I don't know if you meant you think there's, there's not enough um, like resources or there's not enough courses or jobs for people in astronomy, was it? Is that what you meant? Sorry, I, I was saying, um, you know, we have raised the demand that, you know, people can actually do astronomy. But now the curriculum is slow in terms of being put in place. Because there uh, is no, currently there is no curriculum in, in uh, either universities and so forth. So we have raised demand for people to know about astronomy, to learn about astronomy. But within the school system, the curriculum, there is no curriculum for that. Okay. Well, I mean, it is changing. Um, there is, I believe there is a, a, at least one institution that's about to start. I couldn't get official confirmation. I didn't know if it was official, so that's why I didn't mention it. Um, but I agree. I mean, it's slow, but I think you can still, you know, I mean, I, I believe in lifelong learning. You can still encourage people to learn those things. We, we can use astronomy clubs. Uh, you can be learning those things alongside, even if there's not an astronomy degree when you want to go to university you can do physics you can do engineering you can do it uh, and then you can go on to the astronomy later so i i think there's ways around it but yes obviously ideally i agree i would love for there to be more astronomy in school and more astronomy uh, university courses and those are yeah that's it's a, it, those are slow coming up but we're getting there Awesome. And um, in terms of the, you know, how can we be assured that the the value of the SKA will be equally distributed for the across the whole continent? Unfortunately, you know, that's probably impossible to be make it really equally distributed. But <clears throat> there are many types of benefits. Of course, the most direct one is who's getting the money, you know, for building this two billion dollar instrument. That will primarily go to the companies who can help build the telescopes to, you know, they will be roads. You need to build roads. Okay, who's going to build the roads? Um, so in the countries, in the SKA partner countries, there will be some direct uh, benefit. Beyond that, you know, South Africa and DARA and many other people are very keen to make sure that they're qualified people who can help run those facilities in the partner countries who, who know the local conditions. So that will be an indirect benefit. But a lot of the discussion is, um, is broader. You know, the SKA will, will generate an incredible amount of data. And there's an opportunity for young Africans to get data science skills, artificial intelligence skills, machine learning skills, through working with this data, big data, I mean, it's really big data. It's like the biggest data in the world. It's a, we will be getting at peak about one exabyte of data a day. So that's a thousand petabytes or a million So there are opportunities for, uh, for Ghanaians and for other African students to start working with the top scientists in the world. But you know, you know the world. The world is is not too big on handouts often. So it's very much a case of you know people have to grasp the opportunity that comes along. You know, so uh, it's very much something that I would recommend an active approach um, to benefit to to exp to taking advantage of these opportunities. Thank you, Prof, uh, for the wonderful submissions to the question. Uh, please, uh, Leo, you have your hands up. Can I ask yes. something, please? Okay, uh, Leo, just a minute. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sean, please, you can go on. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add something to what has been said before, particularly what Sarah said. Most of what we've been trying to do at the planetarium is exactly to create interest and sustain interest. I've learned one thing. 
During the International Year of Astronomy, IAU, the International Astronomical Union, realized immediately many of the astronomers who help the whole organization throughout the celebration, they were people who did not study astronomy in any university. They got interested and they read books and they taught themselves. So there were more people who were passionate astronomers, not professional career astronomers. Thank and you. some of them, having got the interest, they were able later on to get certification or certificate and degree in astronomy. What we are hoping to do in Ghana, and unfortunately we haven't had any help, is to get school children, young people interested, Thank you. to sustain their interest through the club. Now, when the SKA was open a few years ago, the minister from South Africa did say it will create thousands and thousands of jobs when it becomes functional. But Ghana and other countries need to train people to be ready for it. And it will cut across all areas. What we are also should do in Ghana, which again has to be policy and government, is to get more people to be interested as an interest alone is foster any career and anything anybody want to do. The interest and the benefit of knowing what you learn when you do astronomy will always be beneficial in any career you choose. Because it goes into science and engineering and Africa as a whole, we are particularly behind when it comes to the sciences. So we are hoping astronomy will become the easy stepping stone into science. Currently, we are putting together syllabus to have science in the science of global warming and climate change, all within the astronomy club. I was just talking to Dr. Melvin Lees, and he was suggesting radio astronomy. But radio astronomy, we can start in schools for young children to put together just radio. So we need radio kit for them to put together to have their own radio. From there, hopefully, they'll be interested to go on to radio astronomy, radio telescope. Thank you for the insights uh, that say your contribution. I appreciate it so much. Uh, Jacqueline, you have your hands up. Please kind of go ask your question. Yes, please. Thank you, Sarah, for that really wonderful presentation. I've been following the newsletters from the Planetarium for a while now, so I was very excited to, to see your presentation. I was wondering if you could tell us some more about any volunteer opportunities at the Planetarium, if there are any. Just get in touch with Sarah. <laughs> I was going to say maybe Dr. Ashram is the best person. <laughs> Please call and come. We've got plenty. By the way, just this afternoon, we had a meeting before rushing to join this group. We had a meeting and we were talking about how best to get our new president for the Astronomical Society of Ghana. And we're going to need a general secretary and a treasurer. And we're going to need volunteers and we're going to need national service personnel to be trained in all regions to be able to go around schools to create the interest in astronomy club. Yes, right. so just get on with us, get in touch with us and we, we can discuss. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Well, please, uh, is there any final question for uh, Prof? Prof will probably like to take his uh, leave. If there's any final question, Leo, uh, your well, question? Yeah, I had a question for Sarah. Sarah, thank you very much. And, um, you know, it, it's really exciting. Hello, Leo. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Uh, can, we can hear, but uh, we we'll could hold on with the question for Sarah for now. And uh, oh, okay. if there's a question for Bruce, then uh, we'll ask him if there's none that we can, he can take his leave. Is there any question for Bruce? I have a question from uh, Josiah from... Uh, and I would like to ask this uh, question on his behalf. It says, 
why do we uh, prof uh, so this question says why do we have a, a matter and antimatter symmetry a symmetry in form of matter and antimatter um the laws of physics have the symmetry um between matter and antimatter so for example if you imagine that the early universe is very hot there's no matter there's just light it's radiation it's extremely hot as the universe cools we will start to form matter but we will also form antimatter in exactly the same amount normally for example we can create antimatter and we do that by creating matter and antimatter together but we always create the exact same amount so it's very strange that we observe in our universe that the universe is made of matter and there's no antimatter. We don't see a galaxy of antimatter over there, or you know, a, a, a star form, a star made of antimatter. It's all matter, um, and so that is uh, that's a bit of a mystery. You know, why is there matter? So something must have slightly broken the symmetry between matter and antimatter, and we don't have a good explanation for for why. To put it another way. There are about 10 billion photons of light for every baryon, for every particle of matter. Why 10 billion to one? Why not 1 billion to one or 1 million to one or 100 trillion 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 to one? So that's the, that's the baryon asymmetry problem. I hope that. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, pro. Thanks for the question. Uh, Oh, Eva, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, before uh, uh, Prof leaves, uh, I have a question, just a brief question, and then um, I'd like to find out how the age of the universe is, is measured. How do you measure the age of the universe? <laughs> so that's a very difficult problem. So we cannot do it directly. What we can do is we can do, we can say that the universe must be older than the oldest objects inside it. <laughs> that seems kind of reasonable, right? Um, so we can look at um, stars. We understand how star formation occurs. We understand how stars evolve. So we know that they start off young and then they get older, red, and then they die, they, they blow up. And we sort of understand how long that takes. And we can calculate that for certain types of objects like uh, white dwarfs and others, that could be uh, 10 billion years, for example, to go that. So the fact that we observe those objects is, is reasonably good evidence that the universe is at least 10 billion years old. What we can also do is we can uh, we can measure the expansion rate of the universe, how fast the universe is expanding. And Einstein's theories are quite simple, actually. Einstein's theory of our universe is actually pretty simple. And we can say, okay, that model must fit all of the data that we see about the universe. And, and we can predict many things. And then we can get a best fit model. We can say, okay, this is the model that best explains the universe that we see. And we can say, okay, well, how old would that model be? And that universe turns out to be about 14 billion years old. So it's not, it's not a direct measurement of the age of the universe. It's an indirect measurement. So um, it could be wrong. It could well be wrong. So in cosmology, we always have to say, well, if our understanding is correct, then this is true. It's very rare that we can make a, a very direct measurement, unfortunately, in cosmology. It's always an indirect, um, kind of like Sherlock Holmes deduction. Um, so it's very difficult to make a direct uh, measurement. Okay, thank you so much, Paul, for your time and... Uh... Just before we leave, we would like to take a hour. So the session will continue. Uh, Prof wants to we have to leave now. But before that, we'll take our official group photo with Prof. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So Gamali, over to you or Eva. Thank you very much. Um, 
Evans for uh, for sharing this uh, wonderful session. And I would like to say massive thanks to Bruce and Sarah for your wonderful presentations. And thanks, thank you to everybody else also for, for joining us. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, so the Science Cafe is not over. We are just going to do a quick group photo and kind of officially close, but I'm sure many of us, um, there are many of us here who would still want to continue the conversation. And so you are welcome to continue uh, for some time after. Um, I also have a few words to share about Global Lab. So if you're interested to learn more about what we are trying to do, um, hang around um, to, to, to hear it. So now it's time for the group photo. So if you can please turn on your video, that would be very nice. I'll be shooting, I'll be taking from my side, but I would, um, I would invite other, um, everybody or anybody who wants to, to also take a shot from their side so that we can, can have the best one. Okay. Please kindly turn on your camera if you don't mind so we can see you. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, I have to take it again because I think we are more than there. And then a second one. Lovely. Yes, thank you all very much. Um, and so um, yeah, I, I, let's, I, I would like to share the results of the poll, the first poll that we did so that uh, we can see. So it says that 66% of the people here do not really know much about um, cosmology and astronomy. And then 50% don't know about the various uh, possible astronomical resources in Ghana. So it kind of justifies why uh, we should have a, a session um, like this. So this is, this is quite interesting in that sense. So we are, I'm just going to quickly launch a second poll, if you don't mind. And uh, this poll looks at We have a second poll, and this poll is basically um, interested in uh, yeah, what you feel about what you've heard so far. And also, we are quite curious uh, whether people have actually visited a Ghana planetarium before. <laughs> I'm lucky, at least I've been there like two or three times. So. <laughs> All right, so since, all right, so um, yeah, so since Bruce is hard pressed on time, he's been very generous to um, um, stay for a little bit longer than we had planned to answer our questions. I'll, I'll just say a big thank you and um, goodbye to him. Um, everybody join me to say thank you to Bruce. Thank you. Thanks so much. Lovely. Thank you. 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 Okay. So, um, back to the polls. Um, there are 24 of us, and so far, 21 people have answered. Okay. All right. I'm just going to end it here now and uh, let's see. Let's see what we have. Okay. I think the results have.
Yeah, okay. So, okay, so the keywords that we are seeing here are amazing, uh, stimulating. Nobody help. Thankfully, nobody thinks it's boring, so that's good. And yes, only twenty-seven percent of us here have visited uh, the planetarium. So that that means that you guys have a lot of homework to do. <laughs> well, that's cool. So yeah, we we just use this to kind of have a a snapshot of um, of. Um, yeah, the meeting just to kind of pick some quick data. And so it shows exactly why the Science Cafe is relevant. So I'll just say thank you to everybody and thanks to everybody who is on um, Facebook watching. Um, the, the, the meeting is officially ended, thank you. <laughs>